So welcome officially to our first session on science and religion. And um, we will be meeting tonight and for the next two Wednesday nights uh, with the help of God. And uh, I do have a PowerPoint presentation. And uh, I am going to try and hopefully expand this. So I, I've set up two screens. I'm, I'm really uh, working a little technology magic here for myself. Um, and, um, and we are recording, I think. So does everybody see the, um, now I actually don't remember if I started the recording. So let me start recording, making sure I am recording. Yes, I am recording. Um, so um, we did, but now it's no longer sharing. Yeah, yep. Now I got it. See it again. Yes. 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 Okay. Science and religion, a national. Oops. Oh, That's sorry. <laughs> uh, slideshow. Okay. Okay. So as you see, my, my conclusion is right up there, which is that it is both natural and necessary and a partnership. So that's, uh, that's a tip off of where I'm going, a very powerful tip off. And the other thing I want to point out is that on my website, if you go to my website, this is the welcome page There's a page for classes. And on that page is even an easy a way to get online to this particular Zoom room. And, um, and then I do have PowerPoints. I have a one session talk on this subject. I have a three session talk on this subject. As Jose knows, I taught this in, um, in Guatemala City when I was there for the last high holidays. So there's even uh, slides in Spanish, uh, a bibliography. And you'll see I'm gonna be using a lot of quotes uh, about science and religion. So, so you can see a sheet with, with all of those quotes and their sources uh, clearly delineated. And I'm just checking out there. Okay. Okay. So um, originally this was a four session class, but I, but I don't think we need four sessions. So there are four, there are roughly four subjects. Uh, and tonight we're going to focus on the first one. What is the nature of scientific and religious knowledge. Um, we will then cover what I think are the two critical leaps of faith. A leap of faith, number one, is there a God? And in this context, I, what I mean when I say God is, is there an organizing intelligence in the universe? And I'm gonna be discussing that really from a, from a scientific point of view, not, not so much from a, um, uh, from a faith-based point of view, but really from the physics. Um, and I know I had, we had an interesting discussion earlier today um, with, could I have phrased that as, are there gods? And actually for this purpose of the question, I'm not really focused so much on the nature of God as much as I am, is there an organizing intelligence in the universe? I actually think the science is compelling on that subject. And then what is, as interesting or even more interesting is the question, does this God care? Does the God who created the gravitational constant, the electromagnetic constants, and, and all of these constants, as you'll see, in order to have a universe that works, we need these constants to be perfectly balanced. And we'll even look at the specifics of the numbers of in what way they need to be balanced. So the question is, does that God care whether I have turkey or ham for dinner tonight? Does that God care whether I'm kind to babies or torture babies? That's very much, I think, a leap of faith. Uh, and it, it gets into the whole question of what is the nature of revelation? And then what's the relationship between science and religion? And once again, many of you have studied with me before uh, and I am delighted you are back. And so my style is very much just ask questions as they occur to you. If I feel like we're getting too far afield, I may, you know, ask you to hold your questions. But uh, but I really do um, think it's helpful if uh, if people ask questions, uh, you know, as they occur to you. Okay. Now there was a. I wonder if someone else is. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment because I'm not confident 
Okay, okay, good. I, I wanna make sure that I'm not locking people out from the, uh, in the waiting room. Okay, so first subject. Um, here is, here are the two insights which made me religious. And I'm, go I'm going to strive to use my language carefully. So there are two arguments for the necessity of acting as though there is a God. I'm being very careful. These don't prove that there is a God. For me, and I will again say for me, I think reasonable people can disagree on these, on, on these issues. But for me, these two reasons were compelling. Reason number one, without God, there is no objective morality. So the question is, without appeal to some kind of moral code which transcends humans, how can you prove that what Hitler did was wrong? You may not agree with it, I don't agree with it, but um, certainly what Hitler and Stalin and Pol Pot all did, they were, they were all legal, namely Hitler created laws of Germany and complied with the laws of Germany, so murder you know, of millions of Jews and, and, and you know, disabled people and, and, and so on was not illegal, uh, we would say it's immoral, but in order to say so, we have to appeal to something higher than just the laws of the land. Um, so so there, there has to be some kind of overriding sense of good and evil, of ethics, and I would say that sense of ethics come from God. So that for me was a very compelling and remains a very compelling issue. And uh, Murray, you are raising your hand, so. Am I? Um, I was thinking about it, and I was wondering, mathematically, there's only a few Hitlers and Stalins. So if you think of a bell curve, they're, they're at one end. And yes. literally, average Joe is in the middle. So there's a lot more average Joes than Hitlers. Yes, so yet, that, that, I, I agree with you, but I don't think it really addresses the question of how do we decide what's right and wrong, good and evil, appropriate behavior or inappropriate behavior. Um, Howard, Rabbi. Um, the, the Hitlers and the Pol Pots may indeed be uh, few in number, but in order for them to do the horrific things that they have done, uh, there needs to be a huge number of uh, average Joes and Jones who go along with it. Mm -hmm. um, and that also represents a, uh, a moral stance or a lack of one, but nonetheless falls into the category of morality. Yeah, uh, and, and people have observed that People who saved Jews, to be very specific, in Nazi Germany were not acting rationally or reasonably. If they were acting rationally in their own self-interest, they would not have risked their lives to save the lives of Jews. So, so again, many would say they were responding to a higher ethics. So my question then is, what is the source of those ethics? Or maybe put more precisely, if there is no source of ethics, is there really a higher source of ethics or just who wins the war? Um, uh, Larry. Well, just it may well be that over the centuries, uh, people de developed a sense of morality based on how people responded to what was occurring. Because yeah, how's, that, how's that working out lately? Yeah. Well, it depends. <laughs> that doesn't mean people are adhering to that morality, okay? But what, in effect, what you're telling me is, that I, I believe I have morality. Right. I believe I live according to moral code. Right. I have no belief in God. Yeah, so I, what, what I'm not saying. Is, saying in effect is no, but society, those <clears throat> who, inf who believe in God have influenced me. Yes, I, that, that, okay. that's exactly what I'm saying. So what I am not saying, and I'm glad you raised it, I am not saying that to be moral, you need to believe in God and that religious people are moral, and that irreligious people are 
immoral. Uh, so I'm glad you, you clarified that. Uh, let's see. I think uh, Bryce. I think there was somebody else ahead of me. Uh, yeah, I don't. I do actually don't have the, in this mode. I don't have an order, but uh, I, let's not worry about it too much. Okay. All right. Um, well, I, I would simply say that uh, that there's a an evolutionary effect that morality would evolve along with human beings uh, living together, and that the morality is a way that human beings can live together. It is imperfect, but simply because God has pronounced a certain morality, how's that working out? Yeah, so so I, I agree with you there, um, except in, in my own way of thinking, I really don't trust humanity. Uh, as, as difficult it is to trust God, I trust humanity a lot less. And we're going to talk about that experiments like the, um, um, oh gosh, I can't remember now the um, uh, experiments about about human morality. The um, God. I, I understand when you're you're talking about them or the uh, experiment where the people were tortured. Yes, yes. Or, Milgram. Yeah, Milgram. Yeah, thank you. The Mil Milgram. Milgram experiment. Right, right. Okay, uh, I'm just now looking at uh, uh, the the list and Jerry. Yeah. So I, you know, I. I I'm looking at this and I'm saying, you know, defining things sometimes helps. So we're talking about a moral system effectively, right? Yes, I would say yes. Okay. So, and, you know, I'm just going to point out that, you know, we're all, every, I was listening to everybody's views and look, we are who we are. It's a very Western centric view, you know, um, you know, it's like the classic thing, you know, Star Trek, they're thousands of light years away and everybody looks like they're from Ohio, you know? Um, so, you know, I mean, um, so it's a moral system that we are familiar with that we're all talking inside of. But this is bigger than that. What you're talking about, and I'm sure you're going to get into it. I'm sorry if I'm jumping the gun a little bit. You're talking about something that's effectively inherent in the universe, and that is a, a moral system that comes out of the laws of physics. That's no, what I'm you're not going to talk about, about that. No. Okay. Well, maybe that's what I would have said if you would have asked me before what my interest was. But so, uh -huh. so then maybe let me back up and just say that then, um, you know, when you say intrinsic meaning, I would say that, you know, we're, we're putting it in a context that we understand here. It may be bigger than that. And so, for example, if I may, one more thing, you know, these other people, evil people that we've, you've identified on the screen, Hitler, et cetera, they're operating in a different moral system that they thought was great, right? Right. So is it just they have their opinion, we have our opinion, either one can be right? Or are, is there something deep inside of you which would say Hitler was wrong? Right. So that, so that's to me, moral morality is the source of that judgment. And I'm not going to get into extraterrestrial theology, but that's a really tempting subject. Uh, uh, okay, let's move along. Whoops. Oh, gosh. Uh, okay, I, I I am hopeful that you're still seeing. Yes. The, the screen. It's so yes. weird how this is working. I'm working with two screens. Okay. So the second item is without God, there is no intrinsic meaning to life. And the example I usually use is I pick up a sheet of paper and I say, here's some, here's some paper. Paper is, is an organic hydrocarbon. Um, we are self-aware organic hydrocarbons. Um, if, you, if I burn this sheet of paper, uh, I get carbon dioxide, water vapor, and some energy. If I burn my a child, I get carbon dioxide, some water vapor, and energy. Biochemically, there really isn't any difference. So if the only truth is physics and science, then we are an incredible cosmic accident. And we're gonna spend a lot of time looking at what's the probability that that accident took place and, and you know, how confident do we feel that it's not an accident, that it's guided. But let's say we conclude, you know, through multiverses, there's a couple of arguments against uh, what I'm going to talk about. Um, let's just say it's an accident. If it's an accident, there is no meaning to life. We are living in a biochemical accident. I can't prove that's wrong. I just refuse to live my life 
as though that's true. So Bryce, you have your hand up. Yeah, so I was thinking about what would be an alternative meaning to life other than the fact that we we have an evolutionary drive to do so, but but uh, you know we're basically skating against entropy in a sense. We're we're tacking against the entropic wind, right. and we are. Uh, I would I would cling to this that we are the way that the universe becomes aware of itself. Uh, Carl Sagan. Yes. Okay, I, I like that. It doesn't give meaning to my life, but I like it. Um, Skona. Um, if you just have the golden rule as your morality, mm -hmm. and I know it's, you know, in um, the Torah, but it's also in lots of other religions. Yes. It's also outside of religions. Yes. If you just have that, then you don't need to believe in God and you would still know that Hitler, et cetera, were wrong. I absolutely agree with you, except you would ask, what's the question of the golden rule? And Hitler says, well, I believe in all this stuff. I just don't believe in the golden rule. So you have your right. I have my right. And if I have bigger guns than you do, my right will prevail. But my definition this will be at the very end of all of this. My definition of a kosher religion is one that holds with the golden rule, which says human life is sacred and we should treat other people the way we want to be treated. Ultimately, I believe that any religion that holds with that idea is a kosher religion. Just see if I can figure but that has, But you don't need God for that. Well, the question is, what's the source of the golden rule? Why is the golden rule true? Mathematics. Yeah, it's a nice... I, I, I don't understand how mathematics leads to the golden rule. Well, you get the golden mean. <laughs> I, I understand the law of averages, but Hitler, Hitler said, I'm going to treat Germans well and everybody else I will kill and get their stuff. And, you know, you could argue survival of the fittest sort well, of says the now. same. I'm, I mean, we, we, no, we he lost. Wrong, we he lost, him. but the question is, was he wrong? Well, well, he was wrong because the world rose up and killed him. So if the world hadn't rose up and killed him, you would argue that he was right or that his morality was the same as ours. I didn't agree with it, but, but I No, don't... but that's the only difference. You just don't happen to agree with it. Well, the, the, in other words, it's not more significant than your favorite ice cream. Well, whether you no, believe... I, I would say this. I, w I would answer with this, that, that, that his behavior led to the downfall of his own society. That if a society's moralities and ethics are not uh, sufficiently consistent and humane, that the society will destroy itself. Okay, that's, uh, that's you know, a position that I wouldn't necessarily disagree with. It doesn't solve it for me. It's not, it's um, not satisfying, I, I understand. Um, there are a number of people with hands up and I, uh, let's see, Ira. Okay, uh, back to the golden rule. Uh, as I understand it, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Yes. Right? Unless you're a masochist. That's yeah, one yeah, thing. yeah. I don't think that's <laughs> a second serious thing, argument. Second thing, whether or not Hitler believed in the golden rule... He was doing unto others, and he would expect, therefore, that others would do unto him in a like manner, and they did. Okay, so, but I don't think he would want them to do to right. him and his family what he wants. Whether he wants it or not, that's what happens. But, but that's the golden rule. So let me, let me move along, and we'll never get but done. He didn't, but he didn't consider Jews as people. Right. So uh, for me, the first part of the golden rule is all human life is sacred. Exactly. And you should treat others the way you want to be treated. Yes. Um, Murray then. Uh, yeah, I was, I was going to say, um, uh, as, as was mentioned about the mob mentality that's been shown uh, in psychology classes, the, um, 
what there's one that is not there. It's uh, Jim Jones. He had a cult of personality, and they thought he brought heaven to earth. Um, but I think what defines these people are not not that they're just statistical aberrations, but that they're not sustainable uh, because the Hitler's thousand year empire did not last a thousand years. Um, so I think if you want to talk about morality, maybe it has something more to do with cooperation, like bees or other animals that cooperate to put food on the table. To well, the, to, I would just, I would, I would just whole... observe that the Germans cooperated and were very organized and methodical but it wasn't about sustainable. murdering Jews. Well, it wasn't, it was, it wasn't sustainable because, because of force of power. Had they, I'm actually reading a book right now, uh, which is sort of a what if book had the Germans won and could have happened. Um, Skona, and then I want to move on. Oh, I need to put my hand down, sorry. Okay, okay, I can actually help you do that. Okay, let me move on, whoops. Okay. So I have a lot of quotes and I love them. <laughs> I'm gonna read a bunch of them and in the, the collection of quotes, you will find them. So historians Will and Ariel Durant, there is no significant example in history before our time of a society maintains a moral life without the aid of religion. And from George Washington's farewell address, let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principles. Um, Einstein, I have a bunch of quotes from Einstein. To know the answer to the question, what is the meaning of human life means to be religious? Uh, from Carl Jung, among all my patients in the second half of life, there has not been one whose problem in the last resort was not that of finding a religious outlook on life. And none of them had really been healed who did not regain his religious outlook. And here is my absolute favorite quote in ev of every one of these, any one of these, from Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who, if you want to read the book uh, that convinced me I didn't need to write a book on this subject, this is it. It's called The Great Partnership, um, God, Science, and the Search for Meaning, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, former chief rabbi of Great Britain. Science takes things apart to see how they work. Religion puts them together to see what they mean. Okay, so here's an example. Some of you may have heard me talk about this in the past. And uh, so uh, if, if you've heard me give the answer before, please don't volunteer the answer. So this morning I came uh, into my kitchen and the teapot was boiling. Uh, Larry, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you of something quick before I go. No, I just it, in every one of those quotes, you talk about religion, but not God. Okay. Yes. Yes. All right. So, but I but uh, but I think we understand. Well, I understand those authors as understanding religion being God-centered. Religion doesn't have to God, be God-centered. But uh, but God, they may be God-centered, but that doesn't mean God exists. They no. Remember, I remember I said none of those arguments prove God's existence. Okay. Yeah, yeah okay. Einstein, I don't think Einstein believed in a, in a God like we're talking Yeah, Einstein about. has a, a, a zillion quotes and they go all over the map. So let me get back to, this, to, to my presentation. So this morning I came into the kitchen and the teapot was boiling. So here is a question for all of you. Why was the teapot boiling? Somebody turned the fire on under 212 Fahrenheit. Okay, so there's a whole list of of descriptions which are very mechanistic, which have to do with all the processes involved with raising the, uh, the, the temperature of the water to the boiling point. And I could put you all to sleep with 20 minutes of thermodynamics on that subject. So because the stove heated the water to its boiling point, this is what Aristotle called efficient cause, how the phenomenon takes place. But there's another answer to the question, why was the teapot boiling? Because God wanted the water hot. But Sonia put it on the kettle, on the stove. Precisely. Because God created the conditions that made it so. That's more physics. But another answer, completely orthogonal, completely separate from the physics, is because Sonia started the teapot boiling, because she wanted tea. This is something called, that Aristotle called the final cause, 
the reason the phenomenon takes place. So the question then is, whoops. Ah, do we have to choose between one correct and one incorrect answer? Is it either the physics or because my wife wanted tea or can both of those answers be, uh, be correct? Well, they're that goes in there. with uh, having the God creating the conditions. In no, other no, no, no. Yeah, wife that's, wife that's, that's the physics. That's the, oh yeah, okay, okay. That, yeah, that, that, that goes even further. Okay, so now the question is, why is there a universe? Answer number one is physics. Everything we know about cosmology and indeed a fair amount that we don't know about cosmology, the Big Bang, you know, the first, uh, the creation of time and space and, and all that. We'll talk a little bit about that, uh, I think in the next class. That's answer number one. And answer number two is because God wanted a universe. Oh, that's right. And so the question is, do we have to choose between one correct and the other incorrect answer? And of course, my point is that it's not science versus religion, that these are two elements and they are, it's not one or the other. I don't have to ask myself either physics or God as though one is wrong and one is right, they can both be right. Well, we know Sophie exists. <laughs> so you're talking about Sonia, my wife? Sonia, yes, we know yes. Sonia exists. Yes. So why did God want the universe? Maybe I haven't seen her in, in months. <laughs> <laughs> why did God- Because without Sonia, the universe would be incomplete. Well, my universe <laughs> would certainly be incomplete. So now the question is why does, did or does God want a universe? And I always love to talk about two answers, one I really don't like and one I really like. The traditional answer, and I see this both in Jewish sources and Christian sources, is that if God is to be praised, then we need a humanity to praise God. A uh, little egocentric. Uh, the second one, which I really like, is because God likes stories, or God is lonely, or God you know, is... In yeah, so God wanted partners in the world. Uh, Devar Acher, as, as I'm sure my colleague Howard, maybe some of you know, means a, sort of another question on the same topic, uh, a point on the same topic. The Talmud records a debate that lasted two and a half years as to whether it would have been better if, created, if humanity had or had not been created. So they talked for two years about whether it would have been better if humanity had been created or not created. So I'm really curious. Actually, there's a raise hand thing, not, not for questions. Well, anyway, so you can just wave at me and people will see you. How many of you think um, it would have been better had humanity not been created in the universe? Just kind of wave at me and God. <laughs> How many of you think it would have been better if humanity had been created? Okay, so we got a couple of people waving. Um, they actually voted that it would have been better if humanity had not been created. But they came to the conclusion that since we're here, we ought to make the best of it. Skona, I don't know if your hand is deliberately it's, raised. It's, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, first of all, I think that the second answer, God likes stories, is also egocentric. It's saying we're, we make a good story, we make good partners, worthwhile and all that. So it's also egocentric. Um, oh, I think it's a compliment. That's, uh, that's very interesting. Okay. And um, the second thing is, is this about the, um, it would have been better if we weren't created. That sounds like the psychology um, research that proves um, that people who don't have children are happier. I mean, and they're quite sure of it, those people who prove these things. <laughs> These, science, these psychological scientists. Um, but those of us with children don't buy it. Or may, maybe it's just that, well, we've got our kids, so let's, you know, do the best we can. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so actually, the, 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 like that. And creating a world and having children, you know, God and us, parents and children, are very, um, what's the word, analogous? Yeah, yeah, there, there, there is an analogy. Maybe the direct analogy, I never thought about this, is to ask parents whether they would have been happy, whether, whether they would have preferred not having children. Um, not asking people 
you know, that do have children, don't have children. But, but the, the, the point that I think is interesting is that the rabbis of the Talmud debated this. And by the way, you can bet that they all had children or that most of them had children. <laughs> Um, uh, Ira, you have your hand up? I, no. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, oh, go sir, ahead. indeed. Uh, well, I'm of the opinion that considering the way things are going, it might have been better if God had not created humanity. But one way to work that out is if the dinosaurs had not died out and some of them were extremely intelligent by all accounts, and it would have been them that would be uh, uh, praising okay, so, God. So, so I just, so, you I know, just, not us, yeah, so I agree with, else. so I agree with you, and the rabbis agreed with you. The rabbis basic, but, but the point that the rabbis making were, here we are, we better make the best of it. Bryce. I was gonna say that, that if, uh, if, I think it's more likely that God likes neutrinos, okay, uh, because there's certainly a whole lot of them. But if, if, if the whole purpose is to get stories, he must be pretty patient because it took about 13 billion years to get here. What a guy. <laughs> okay, so let's move on. I want to talk about the difference between knowledge and faith. Knowledge in Hebrew, da'at, uh, faith in Hebrew, emunah. I have knowledge that this pen exists, that this computer exists, and I can test that knowledge using scientific experimentation. That's knowledge. Faith, my faith in God, my belief in God is not quite the same. It carries a measure of doubt. So both in Hebrew and in English, we have a difference between knowledge and faith, and that's what I want to explore. So uh, scholars in this field talk about four different models of the relationship between science and religion. One is conflict. Either the universe was created in 13.8 billion years or six days. It can't be both, although there are some interesting physics ways of, of, of resolving that conflict, but that's one model. The second model is independence. Religion lives in a world over here Science lives in a world over here. They address different questions, and they, they really don't, we don't have to worry about uh, the other. In the world of science, I don't have to worry about religion. In the world of religion, I don't have to worry about the world of science. Third model is dialogue, that, there's a, that there is a, a communication between worlds. And then the fourth model is integration, that both are in fact uh, necessary, and they talk with each other. And as you'll see, when we come to the final conclusion in the class, my position goes even further than number four in that I believe, uh, and I, you know, I'm sure that we will have some interesting discussion on this. I believe, I'm trying to get, look at the chat room, oh, uh, I lost it. Okay, I believe that um, science and religion are in fact uh, necessary for each other. I would argue and will argue that science can't do its job without religion, and religion uh, can't do its job without uh, science. And Scone is asking, where in the Talmud is that debate? And I don't know offhand, but it's not that hard to find by Google. And if you have trouble finding it, I will find it. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, more quotes. Uh, science investigates, religion interprets. Religion and science are two hemispheres of human thought. I'm going to skip some. From Jonathan Sachs, again, truly my hero in this world. For if science is about the world that is, and religion is about the world that ought to be, then religion needs science because we cannot apply God's will to the world if we don't understand the world. That's, for me, a very important point, which I will come back to at the end. It's particularly true as I understand Judaism. If the purpose of Judaism is to make the world a better place, we call it tikkun olam, uh, then we better understand how the world works. If I'm ill, pray for me. Knock your socks out. Pray for me. But help me get to a doctor. Because the doctors have studied how illness works, and those are the guys I, I want to talk to. I'm not discounting 
the role of prayer, but I want to have folks that understand how the world works. And of course, Copernicus, so vast without any question, is a divine handiwork of the almighty creator. Let's see if I can get this thing to advance. Okay. Um, a long quote, and I'll, I'll just read the end of Einstein here. The situation may be expressed by an image. Science without religion is lame. Religion without science is blind. Followed by um, my favorite quote from Einstein, which is the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. The idea that we sitting here, we're blobs of protoplasm, sitting on this insignificant planet revolving around an insignificant star can contemplate with some certainty as to what happened 13 billion years ago in the creation of the universe and the laws that bind all of this together is astounding and is possible only because the universe is subject to human comprehension. So I share Einstein's awe about that. I don't know why this is not letting me advance. Hmm. Oops, sorry. Okay, yes, okay, here we go. Um, Judaism has always had, let me put it this way, Judaism has, I don't know, always, I don't know if we go back to Abraham, uh, a attitude of respect towards secular knowledge. There is a blessing, there are many blessings that you say, and I love talking about the blessings, but there is a particular blessing that you say when you meet a secular scholar. There's a separate blessing you say when you meet a religious scholar, but the one for secular scholar is Baruch uh, Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, ruler of the universe, who has given of his knowledge to human beings. We understand that God wants us to have knowledge. This is very famously the request of King Solomon. He asks not for wealth, but asks for knowledge and insight. And we ask for knowledge, wisdom, and insight, traditional Jews do, three times each weekday, uh, and actually uh, four times on the Sabbath, uh, in the Amidah, the central prayer of, of every Jewish service. So now I want to move again on, on the subject of knowledge and faith to the question of, is doubt okay? Because if you take the idea of faith seriously and distinguish the concept of faith as separate from the concept of knowledge, that raises the question of doubt. So, um, is doubt kosher? Um, I, that's why I should change the name of this slide. Is doubt kosher? Is doubt okay? And I believe it is, and I believe it's a central lesson in the Torah. And it comes out of the, uh, the generation of the Exodus. Consider for the moment the generation of the Exodus. This was a group that saw some pretty powerful um, miracles. You know, people sometimes come to, you know, the, the old story, you could come to the rabbi and say, a uh, religious leader and say, Rabbi, if I only could see a, a small miracle in my life, I would believe. You know, not a billion dollar lottery ticket, maybe just a measly $10 million lottery ticket. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the answer is, let's look at the, at the Bible. This actually is, 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 is a, an important story and lesson, irrespective of what you think of the Bible because it's, it's significant as to what the Bible says about this particular question. And, and that is, the generation of the Exodus saw some pretty impressive miracles. They saw 10 very powerful plagues. The Nile, you know, turns to blood, darkness, hail, death of the firstborn, pretty impressive stuff. They leave, they walk through the waters uh, with the Egyptians chasing them, and once they're clear and the Egyptians get into the waters, the waters crash in on the Egyptians. Very impressive. Now they're in the desert and they're getting manna from heaven. They're getting, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, delivery, food delivery services um, <laughs> straight from heaven. 
six times a day with a double portion on Friday. Uh, it's very impressive. They come to Sinai, and Moses is one day late coming down from Sinai, yeah, and the people get Aaron, the high priest for crying out loud, to make a golden calf and proclaim this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. So if, um, if faith for them is difficult, if not impossible, how much more difficult is faith for us who haven't seen these miracles? And the insight uh, on this, I called the police car example. Let's say you're driving down the freeway. For you Easterners, that's what we call parkways and expressways. We call them freeways. You're driving down the road um, at the unofficial speed limit of 72 and a half miles an hour. And all of a sudden, you're about to overtake a police car. And, uh, or maybe you're even going faster. Maybe you're going 80 miles an hour. And the police car is going 65. Do you zip by and thumb your nose at the policeman? Or you Let's, slow down. You slow down. There's a long line of cars dutifully driving 65 miles an hour with everybody's hands at 10 and two and sitting alert and certainly not texting and so on. Um, why? The reason is, of course, if you zip by, you would reasonably assume with high likelihood that you were going to be punished, namely that you would get a ticket. Um, if we had perfect faith in God, let me make it personal. If I had perfect faith in God, every moment of my life would be like driving, not only with the highway patrol car behind me, but with the highway patrol car in the next seat with his ticket book out. <laughs> or even worse, my father of blessed memory sitting in that seat, as he did when he taught me how to drive. Um, if we had perfect certainty in God, I believe that takes away free will. If we absolutely believe that God would punish good deeds and reward uh, wrongdoing, and we saw evidence of that in, a, in, his, in, a, in, uh, in life, we would no longer have uh, free will. And I believe one of the major elements of Judaism, as I understand it, is that God wants us to have free will. And I would observe that we do have free will. Um, the, the word Israel reflects this. You may recall from the, from the Bible, Jacob gets his name changed from Yaakov, which means heal. Why, how did he get such a wonderful name as heal? Because he was holding oh, on to his came name. out. <laughs> Sorry? Well, he was holding on to his brother. Right. And, and my understanding in Hebrew is that it has the same wonderful connotation to be called heel as it does in English. <laughs> um, and he gets his name changed when he wrestles with God, an angel, unclear in the text, very interesting question. Yisrael means one who wrestles with God. So not only is doubt okay, I often describe the experience that, you know, I'm sure, Howard, uh, you've had and... and um, of visiting people in a hospital and having, you know, trying to comfort people after uh, nightmarish things have happened in their life. And they come to me and they say, Rabbi, I've got a big problem with God. How could God allow X to happen to Y? Cancer to my loved one, you know, COVID virus, uh, earthquake, you, you name it. I've got a big problem with this God. And my response is, welcome to the club. I'm in this club too. And we name ourselves God wrestlers. We name ourselves the people who struggle with God. And I love the idea that you can wrestle with God. And there are numerous examples in the Torah of Moses, of Abraham, of people who wrestled with God and win, uh, which I think is, is a, for me, a beautiful uh, lesson. So now the question is, is the universe the result of God or simply a scientific phenomenon? So why am I so interested in this question? Uh, one major reason is my training and my career in physics. So I, as I started saying uh, earlier, and I know uh, some, some people have joined since then, I was trained, uh, trained as a physicist. I have 
undergraduate and graduate degrees in physics. And I've actually had several careers, but my major career was working in alternative energy. Uh, I was a science nerd. I was the math nerd. I was the scrawny little kid that you remember from elementary school who would remind the teacher that they forgot to give homework. Um, <laughs> for me, you know, understanding how the world works was my goal in life. I loved basic physics. I wasn't that crazy about quantum mechanics and exotic physics. Too much math, not enough sort of insight and understanding. Um, and then I discovered the depth of my Judaism and it was through tragedy in my life. Uh, many of my friends here, you know, that live in, in, in our community here, know that my late wife, Carol of blessed memory, had an illness called Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease is in some ways the worst of, of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. It's a motor disorder and it's also uh, a dementia inducing disorder. And it's excruciatingly slow. The average time between diagnosis and passing is 20 to 25 years. My, my late wife spent 12 years in a nursing home. And it's genetic and it's a dominant genetic disease. So that if your children have the gene, and back when we decided to have children, there was no test for the gene, but now there is, and, uh, and it will affect my children. One is already quite, one of my, my, my middle daughter, Stephanie, is quite ill. Um, this raises significant theological questions and the need for answers, and I would say the need for comfort. And I had this sense fairly early on because I, I could tell in her early 30s, in my early 30s, mid 30s, that she was gonna get the illness because I knew what the telltale symptoms were. And I could see that this would be something that she would be developing. Um, and sometimes as I look back on it, I, I reflect that I needed a spiritual strength bank uh, from which I would make deposits and have made over the course of my life and from which I have made some pretty hefty withdrawals. And in struggling with that, I wrestle with God, and I struggle with the idea of God. And the, the simple answers, which you sometimes hear in religion, um, sometimes in Judaism, but I would say not so much in Judaism, don't worry, God has a plan, everything's in God's control, this is all for the best, God never gives you, you know, more uh, than you can handle, and so on. None of those are comforting. Um, in fact, um, I would start going to these uh, spiritual retreats, and I know Robin and I, Robin Feldman and I went to uh, some uh, at the same time. And uh, there are some pretty hard-nosed rabbis and some amazing rabbis, and the two who were most helpful to me were Larry Kushner and Mordechai Finley. And the, for me, the most comforting thing I heard from these people was the idea that this just stinks. There's no good answer, it stinks. The question that we often ask, which is why me, why did God allow this happen to me, is not a particularly good question. And it's not a particularly good question because there is no answer. And if there was an answer, it wouldn't be helpful. And what these rabbis helped me do is rephrase and come to what was a more important question, which had the, the twin uh, assets of being answerable and helpful, and that question being, what do I do now? How do I take what I'm learning, how do I take what I'm going through, and turn it into something that makes my life better and makes other people's lives better? And so that ultimately is what led me, as I look back, on to grow my interest in Judaism. So around this time in my mid-30s, I who had been bar mitzvah but did almost nothing in being bar mitzvah, I never went to a high holiday service in my life. We joined a, a reform synagogue in Southern California, Temple of Dad Elohim, and a few amazing things happened to me in that context. One amazing thing was I met a rabbi who was younger than I was. I never knew that was possible. Uh, and until, until that time, indeed, I had never met a rabbi younger than I was. 
And equally unlikely in my understanding of the rabbinate, here was a rabbi who welcomed questions and welcomed challenges and welcomed discussions and had a sense of humor. And those, those of us who have been you know, at, at Adat Elohim for a while know that I'm talking about Alan Greenbaum. And so the more I learned about Judaism, the more I loved it. And so I started taking classes and then occasionally I would teach a class and I did, you know, did a, a lot of studying. And then at age 50, I applied to and was accepted at Hebrew Union College and was ordained at, at age uh, 55. Uh, so that's why I'm interested in this question. Uh, and again, and I, th I think I'm getting toward the wrap up of tonight's discussion, although we certainly will have our discussion. The two reasons to act and live as though there is a God for me is if there's no God, there is no objective good and evil. And if there's no God, there's no intrinsic meaning to life. Again, emphasizing that these reasons don't speak to the question of whether there is or is not a God. But for me personally, they address the question of why I became religious. And by the way, there are problems on both sides. Those who reject God will have to address all of the evidence that we'll talk about next week, which is the evidence for God's existence and provide a basis for living an ethical life. And those of us who accept the idea of God will have to explain the basis or the, I guess, the underlying reasons uh, for our acceptance of God in light of the enormous evil and tragedy in the world. And we will address both issues. Um, and in doing so, and I, I kind of alluded to this earlier, I believe, again, this is just autobiographical. For me, there are two leaps of faith which dominate my thinking in this subject. The first one is, is there a God? And by God, I, I once took a, a rabbinic class in spirituality, the Institute for Jewish Spirituality. And one of the teachers there said, uh, somebody asked her to define God. And this was her response. She said, God is, <laughs> that was her response. I thought it was quite eloquent. But to be specific here, when I say God in this, in the context of this discussion, what I mean is, is there an organizing intelligence behind the creation and I guess you could say the, the, um, the sustaining of the universe. Um, and for that question, I believe there's a lot of evidence from science and physics, and we're gonna talk about that next time. And then the next leap of faith is, does God care? And as I, I mentioned earlier, the question is, does God care whether I have turkey or ham for dinner? Does God care whether I care for or torture babies? Because if I just understand God as the laws of physics, kind of the Greek view of God, the unmoved mover, the laws of physics don't care what I eat for dinner, and they don't care how I treat anyone. All they care about, if we can even use the word caring in the context of the laws of physics, is you know that the laws of physics aren't violated, and it turns out that's, that's pretty straightforward. And next time we will talk about the subject is there a God? But we do have time for a discussion, questions, and alternative sermons. Um, so, uh, okay, there's some chats to me privately, but, but Susan Gallant mentioned, Suzanne, sorry, Gallant mentioned to everyone, I've experienced two miracles, the birth of each of my children. And there I would say, I absolutely agree with you, although I haven't experienced the birth of your children. Um, but, but we are surrounded with miracles. I guess that that is one of the essential ideas in Kabbalah. We are surrounded by miracles. Uh, I believe in those miracles. And there, there is a great story about two guys who were walking through the parted Red Sea and they literally had their eyes in the mud. They were looking down and they were fetching. Imagine fetching. Uh, imagine <laughs> Jews fetching. Um, especially, especially in the desert. Especially, especially in the desert fetching or? Yeah, yeah. Oh, 
Um, so they were saying mud, mud, mud. You know, we used to make mud from bricks and now, now my feet are stuck in this mud. Oh God, Moses schlepped us. I don't think they actually spoke Yiddish in those days. <laughs> Moses schlepped us out of Egypt. We're following this lunatic and nothing good ever happens to us. Look at this, mud. Who the hell knows where we're going? And they com the, the Midrash says they completely missed the miracle. So in the same vein, I think Suzanne would argue, I would argue that we are surrounded by miracles. In my own study of science and biology, and particularly, uh, quite frankly, as it relates to Huntington's disease, if you start understanding, oh, let, me put it, let me make it personal. As I have come to understand what's going on in every cell of my body with DNA, and the structure there and imperfections in the DNA and little messengers, I'm not even sure what they're called, running up and down my genes and, and DNA, repairing the DNA. You know, cut your finger, see how long it takes to heal. Now slash your tire and pray for it to heal. You know, say a, say a, you know, a Misha Berach for your tire. Um, it's astounding. Life is miraculous, but by that definition of miracle. I don't believe in miracles that violate the laws of physics. So that's where I, I draw the line. So what I want to do now is just open for discussion. Bryce. So in, in, uh, I think implicit in your definition of miracle is that there is a positive good, uh, at least in the frame with which you view this miraculous event. But if you're just talking about the same kind of thing with all your, your cells and, and all of these things that are miracles, then COVID-19 is a miracle also because it's two dissimilar viruses that apparently got together miraculously in a bat or something like that. And it, it, is, it, is, it is infective in a way that that either one of them separately were not so yeah so I, I i will even i will even draw it more specifically um the engine behind evolution is mutation yes mutation is also behind cancer Certainly. so so that gives me pause to think but i but i would agree with you and so what i would say is the does god care part of the miracles of COVID mm -hmm. is God asks us not to make weapons, to use our intelligence and our resources to heal uh, rather than to hurt. So the miracle truly th that the virus exists, that there are horrible things, that there are earthquakes and, and so on is true. Now the question is, what's our response? It's just like what the rabbis taught me. Rather than say, why me, why, why COVID? the rabbis would teach us to say, okay, what do I learn from this and what do I do with it? Uh, Ira and then Murray. Okay, uh, two things. First, on the idea of Israel rust wrestling with God, and sometimes they win. Now, arguing with God, God and win. Arguing with God. Argue with God, wrestle with God, yes. whatever, and win. Now, if God is all powerful, Either he's not, or he threw the match. Okay, so I, would, I will get to that discussion. And as you will see, both I and Harold Kushner would argue that God is not all-powerful. Um, so that, that, that's okay. my conclusion. Okay, and the second thing is at the end of one of your slides, it says, hang on. Yes. Now, to the question of or to the, uh, go farther than what happens if you have this terrible thing happen and you want to know what do you do next that's the answer hang on well don't let go hang on yeah so you know i i have a a t-shirt i bought at the queen mary when i conducted a a wonderful wedding at the queen mary and the boat? and and the yeah the boat uh, yeah, not the queen. Uh, 
and yeah, it's a qu- it's a quote from Churchill, which says, "Never, never, ever give up." And so, uh, yeah, I agree with you, but but it's more than hanging on; it's do something. There is a midrash at the beginning of this, of Oops. at the moment where the sea is splitting, and there's a very interesting little quote in the text where God, where Moses, you know, tells the the Israelites wait for this, wait, wait, God will, will save us. And then God says, why do you cry out to me? And the text doesn't record that Moses cried out at all. But the rabbis in, in Midrash say, the problem was that Moses was praying and it was time to take action. So there's a Midrash of, of Nachshon uh, jumping into the water and the seas don't part until people actually do something. So I would say, don't just pray, do something. Murray, and then Robin and Larry. Um, thanks. I, I must say that I don't believe in any kind of supernatural organizing intelligence um, and certainly um, should not be referred to as he. Particularly in Genesis, it says he has uh, feminine and, ma- and masculine. And right. there's other weird things like you know, an hour image, meaning that is plural and yes, all sorts yes, of yes. other things. Yes. But what I want to say is when you put a, is it, is it some kind of um, wordplay there? When you entitle something like science and religion, I mean, how dare you religious people put your religious, you know, barbaric th- thoughts on par with science. And then the other half of me says, well, you, you, you better watch, you know, you better not step on these people's toes or they're going to throw you in jail with Galileo. So that's that part of religion that I really don't like is that they've been a hindrance to science. for also So do you, do you like the part of science that the, the Germans got the cost of murder down to half a penny a person? I never said that I don't believe in ethics. I no, no, I, I, I just understand. Don't believe they, no, they, there's, there's aspects of religion which I absolutely reject and hate, and as aspect of science and engineering that I absolutely Well, let's put it this way. I can't define evil, but I know it when I see it. Yeah, but did Hitler know it when he saw it? I can only speak for myself. Right. So I know who, it when I see it. I understand, but, but what do the rest of us do, Murray? We, you're not always around for us to solve these problems. <laughs> Well, um, what do we, you know, it, it, on the other hand, what do we do when, uh, when the religious people go nuts and start attacking us? Right. Absolutely. We, we reject it. And there is a book I have called The Great Big Book of Horrible Things. And it recounts <laughs> the hundred worst. Let me, let me just grab it so you can believe that there is such Number a thing. Number one, that book, right? I don't recommend this book as a gift, <laughs> but and it's it's big. Is it illustrated? And it recounts a hundred worst. Is it, is it illustrated? Uh, no, but, it, it, but there are some maps. It's on the ninety-nine cent table. <laughs> uh, it recounts the 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 definitive chronicle of history's hundred worst atrocities, yeah. and I don't remember the numbers offhand, but about. Seven or eight percent are attributable to religion. Um, so we're humans. We screw things up. I actually believe, both as a scientist and as a rabbi, that we have ra id a desire to self gratification, irrespective of what anybody else wants, literally in our genes. Uh, and I don't mean our, you know, our Levi's. I mean, I mean our our DNA, and I believe that's a consequence of being created in the image of animals. In uh, Murray in Genesis one twenty seven, God says, "Let us make humanity in our image." And I believe he was talking. I think we're going to talk about this next time. He was talking to the animals. So Who's indeed, he? we are made in the anim- in the image of animals. You just call them he. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, so, I, so, so I can I can stumble, and I don't believe God is male, and I don't even know what that means if I believed it. 
Does, would that be saying God has a penis? Would that be saying God has X and Y chromosomes? Uh, yeah, that's kind of what I, that says. But, but that's not what I mean. I, I don't want to call God. I know, it, and it's a problem, and nobody seems to want to solve that problem. Oh, no, no. Look at the Reform prayer book. Nowhere in English will it refer to God in any gendered way. So, so that Reform prayer book God does doesn't not use, need a gender. He's not going to have to reproduce. He's forever. Uh, let's, let's, let, let, the issue sure. revolves around, ultimately and originally around Hebrew, because there is no word for it in Hebrew. Everything is either well, male or female. There is an it in English, so why not just use that? Yeah, but, but to call God an it seems to be condescending. So I will, Murray, I will strive not to use gendered language uh, for God. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I didn't mean to bust your chops. No, no, no. My, 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 chops, are op- my, my chops are open for busting. Um, uh, we can, if, I, if I wrestle Mark, with I God, to... Murray, why shouldn't I wrestle with you? Uh, but, but no, but, but, but more, more fundamentally and importantly, I agree with you, and I try to discipline my speaking. And, you know, and I, 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 I'm not one of those who will try in 50% of the time to refer to God as she. Well, um, well let me just say this. Hold I on mean, a second, Bryce. There are other people. Oh, okay. Um, Robin, you haven't said uh, much. Yes, so my comment is that Eleanor Roosevelt said, when the tough get going and you're at the end of your rope, tie a knot and hang on. Okay, thank you, Eleanor. Uh, and Larry. Mine is just a uh, comment regarding, as you know, you and I have different views of God, but you said something that I strongly believe in. In my experience in life, people spend far too much time talking about the problem and not at that time talking about the solution. Oh, that's interesting. So how do you mean that in the context of this discussion? The discussion is, it's what we do. We shouldn't sit around saying, woe is me, woe is me. Right. We should look for what we can do about it. And one of the things that I often mention is the English word religion comes from the same uh, root as the word for ligament. It's that which connects. And ultimately, I think that, for me, surviving the tragedy of my late wife's illness, and it wasn't, it wasn't she was hit by a truck, it wasn't that she developed pancreatic cancer and died in a few years, it was 20 years. And I don't think I could have remained sane without my synagogue. Um, it's autobiographical and personal, but it also taught me a valuable lesson, which is that the only time I felt human in the aftermath of that experience was when I was able to use what I had learned in that experience to help others, which is why I went from being a happily employed and reasonably well-paid physicist to you know spend about seven years not working at all uh, for a gainful employment, uh, being a rabbinic student. Um, Bryce, you have your hand up. And yeah, I... so I just wanted to say that I have a solution to the God pronoun, uh, I think. And, and if we look at Elohim, all right, that mm-hmm. is a term which ultimately has a female characteristic as well as being a, a, having a plural characteristic as, as well. I mean, as, as far as the origin of the term, I've been doing some reading. But if we call, if we say God, because God is male and female, let's just call God they. Uh, I've never heard of anyone calling God they. Well, that's not Uh, monotheism. Well, no, 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 because there are people in the transgendered. Yes. And there are people that, 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 uh, that say, I don't want to be male. I don't want to be female. I don't want to be an it. So they chose the the word they. So let me just offer the following testimony, which comes from the root word for testes. So the hand you can see is raised. And put it I, on your thigh. Well, that's the euphemism. Yeah, put it on your thigh. Okay, it's, it's close to my thigh. Um, uh, I absolutely reject the notion that God is gendered, and I will strive. Uh, to to reflect that in my speaking, and I do, uh, but I will slip, 
And when I slip and call God he or she, uh, I am not making a theological statement about the gender of God. Uh, Ira, you are muted. No, I don't have my hand. Uh, oh, okay, anymore. okay. It was, it was raised. Uh, Rachel. Um, yeah, I certainly don't believe that God could have gender. That doesn't make sense in any way. Um, but in terms of um, the pronoun, I, I, because I don't think God has gender, I'm not going to say she or he. Um, but, you know, those are both one syllable words. So is God. So mm -hmm. if we just repeat God over and over instead of saying he or she, it's pretty simple. Yes, it is simple. And I will, and I try to do it. And many times I succeed. Um, in Hebrew, um, God is either, uh, there are female names for God. Yah is one. Um, Shekhinah is another. And so, so the question is, you have to decide as if you look in the Reconstructionist prayer book, you can take your pick of saying Baruch Ata Adonai or Baruch At Yah. But you, you stumble on, on that one. And there's actually a gender neutral way of saying that, which would be Nivarech which would be a we bless, because the, the, the first person singular and plural is not gendered in Hebrew. Uh, Jerry, you're muted. Yeah, sorry, I get side conversation. Um, Thou shall sorry, not have any other conversations before me. Yeah, correct. <laughs> Literally, the Torah says, al panai, which means in my face. So That's Jerry, right. no so other conversations face. in my face. While we're on Zoom, yes. Yes. So, um, so I, I'm thinking, does it matter, right? Um, I mean, does it does it even matter for to try to understand God? Whether it, this whole discussion about gender, I, I I just personally, I I I try to put that aside because I don't think it's helping my understanding of the nature of God. Right? So what I would say, having struggled with that, is I trust women who say it matters to them. It doesn't yeah. matter to us because God's just one of the boys. Yeah, but, but I'm not saying it that way. I, I'm saying genderless completely is, is my is oh. most of how I feel about it. Not male and female. No, that's more of a Hindu view of things. I'm right. saying just genderless because in my view, you know, trying to understand God, we're, we have these little glimpses of, of what yes. God may be, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the shadows on the wall again, Aristotle, right? right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. just all this little, little tiny views of it. But mm -hmm. to try to understand, I just think we get hung up on it is what I'm trying to say. Yes. And then, you know, we, it's, it becomes this block. We're trying to put it in our, in our box of understanding. Yes. You know, because we're human beings. And, yeah, and, 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 and so the problem is, is language. And right. what do we say? Yeah. And in English, we at least have a hope of being gender neutral. It's much more difficult in Hebrew. And, you know, if you're breaking bread in your home and you every now and again say, Brucha at ya, uh, hamotzi, la, uh, now I can't even, you know, it, it, for, for a blessing, Brucha at ya, hamotzi lachem. Min Haaretz. I don't think it would be even Hamotzi. Uh, I, I don't know quite how to say it in Hebrew, but I think Motzi is yeah. probably male in gender. So ha, probably Hamotza Lachem Min Haaretz. So do you want to struggle with Hebrew grammar every time you say a blessing? Uh, no, I, I guess what I'm saying is mm -hmm. I, it doesn't trouble me how the grammar lays out. And again, maybe because I'm male and so, you know. Yeah, I, so, not, so I remember at a dot Elohim, when we went to the gender neutral prayer book, as yeah. uh, we in the, in the rabbinate call it the gates of, of gender or the gates of gray, uh, there was a lot of controversy in our synagogue. I don't know, Howard, if you had the same experience when, when, um, when we went to gendered prayer books and, and we, stopped calling, we stopped using the he's, and that probably wasn't the big deal, but instead of saying the Lord is one, saying the eternal is one, you know, people have deep attachment to certain phrases. And so that's, uh, you know, I, the, the, as, as, as my grandmother right. used to say, so, that should be our worst problem. So I, I guess just one last thing I'll say then, 
it, it just, you know, we've struggled a lot with this in our tour study group here in the, you know, in the East Coast. And, you know, eventually we just have to say, okay, we all understand. Let's try to understand, right. you know, you know, like beyond that. Right. Yes. And, yes. and, you know, it's like try to get over the edge of it, you know? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other thoughts, comments? I'm going to stop the recording.